Okay, so we left off with chapter 25 um, talking about, you know, the different classification of organisms and the kind of this tree of life that puts everything together in the different domains. Um, so here's your common ancestor. So another way to draw this tree, we could say coming this way, you have the bacteria domain, right? And then um, from that, you could have then your two eukarya and archaea. I had it right the first time. All right, so archaea, um, and this would be your ancestor here. And so, so that's kind of like the tree of life here. Um, and so what we're going to do is talk about a little bit about um, how we know bacteria um, uh, and archaea, uh, bacteria came before the eukaryotic organisms. And so that's what this is, is we're going to piggyback on that tree of life and look at the diversity of life and how we know certain things. So the first section of ch chapter 26 is about early earth. So the conditions on early earth make the origin of life possible. So their chemical and physical processes on early earth may have produced very simple cells through a sequence of stages. So the first stage is abiotic symptoms synthesis. Abiotic means um, not within living things. And so of small organic molecules, um, an example would be amino acids. Amino acids, remember, are the building blocks of protein, and they are small organic molecules. They contain carbon. And we're going to see in the picture below that these guys can be made within the laboratory, and so therefore the abiotic part. Two, joining of these small molecules into polymers. So we have the organic molecules made, and then they can link together to make a polymer. An example with the amino acid uh, is hooking together is a polypeptide or a protein. And then packaging of molecules into protobionts. Um, th what these are are... Um, uh, little cell, cellular st structures like this, all right? And they're basically um, uh, lipids, a lipid bilayer like this. So it goes all the way around. And lipids do this. Um, they are self, uh, they will do this on their own. If you put the lipids, phospholipids, into water, they will send them, assemble themselves so that the head part is the hydrophilic part going towards water and the tail part um, in the center going away from water because they're hydrophobic uh, or nonpolar. And so then you would have water on the outside and water on the inside. And so these small mo these molecules then join into polymers and then pa are packaged, can, could have been packaged into these um, kind of early bubbles, kind of early cells. And then the origin of self-replicating molecules. Replicate, self-replicating would be DNA. Example would be DNA or RNA. All right, so synthesis of organic compounds on earlier. So these are the four steps. And so we're going to talk about that first step synthesis here. Um, Earth formed about, I'm going to put it here, 4.6 billion years ago along with the rest of the solar system. Earth's early atmosphere contained water vapor and chemicals released by volcanic eruptions. So it's very volatile. Experiments simulating an early Earth atmosphere produced organic molecules. Remember, organic means containing carbon from inorganic precursors. But such an atmosphere on early Earth is unlikely. Um, and so, so when we look here um, at this particular experiment, these there are two scientists, Miller and Ure, experiment. And they made this apparatus, and let's just talk about this apparatus. They tried to simulate what the atmosphere on early Earth might have been like. So they have some of the compounds, um, CH4, NH3, H2, that they thought um, 
uh, could be as part of the atmosphere. And then we have these electrodes. The electrodes are simulating lightning, and so obviously they are a source of energy. And then there's also water vapor. So we have a container of water here with a flame underneath it. So so that's your flame heating up the water. So you can see it's boiling, the water evaporates, so now we have water vapor that enters into the atmosphere, okay? So you have this flow this way, and then this um, atmosphere can flow through here, and this is a condenser. So right here, this is the width of the, the tube that the, the air is in, and so that tube goes through this thing here, which is called a condenser. If I were to do a cross section of this, you would see here where this is where the air would be. So that's the airflow in the center. And around it, this is, that's the condenser. The condenser has cold water. So around this, see that's why it says cold water going in, it's surrounding here and that flows back out. So you have a constant influx of cold water. What that, what that does is cool the air off inside here. And so what, is the, what do the water molecules do? They condense, they start moving slower, hydrogen bond to each other and form liquid water molecules and it collects here all right and then that ends up with the water here and you have this constant flow well this part here is important because this stopper you can lift it up and collect some of that water that has condensed and what they did is they analyzed it chemically so that's why it's a sam sample for chemical analysis and what they found is this the cool water contains organic molecules and an example that they found is amino acids. So that's kind of like, this is abiotic, and that's what we're talking about up here um, in number one. So that it's possible to make amino acids um, not within a living thing. Okay, so let's change, turn the page here. So instead of forming in the atmosphere, the first organic compounds may have been synthesized near submerged volcanoes, submerged means underwater, and deep sea vents, all right, where the gas is. So that's why up here it says um, the experiments simulating early Earth atmosphere produced organic molecules from inorganic precursors, but such an atmosphere on early Earth is unlikely. So they did this here um, to represent the atmosphere, but these gases also are um, emerge from underneath the water from a volcano or deep sea um, vents, and so therefore it could, it's more likely probably that they may have been synthesized near those in, within the water. All right, some other people, um, uh, they've looked into extraterrestrial sources of organic compounds. So extraterrestrials are like outside of the earth here. So some organic compounds from which the first life on earth arose may have come from space. So something that hits, hits um, the earth. Carbon compounds have been found in some meteorites that landed on earth. So, um, so some people think that that's a possibility. Um, looking outside Earth for clues about the origin of life, the possibility that life is not restricted to Earth is becoming more accessible to scientific testing, like testing the meteorites that come from um, outside of our planet, outside of our atmosphere. Um, so that is not ruled out. Okay, so... So then let's look at the second step. So that was all about step one, the abiotic synthesis of organic molecules. Step two was the synthesis of polymers. So abiotic synthesis of polymers. Small organic molecule, molecules polymerize, that's the process of becoming a polymer or making a polymer, when they are concentrated on hot sand, clay, or rock. So, <clears throat> so we found, they found that you put small organic molecules onto warm sand, clay, hot sand, clay, or rock, that they will polymerize and form polymers. So it's possible that that may have happened on early Earth. All right, so I kind of went over protobionts um, over here, but this we're going to look at a little bit more in depth because that's the third step. Third step is packaging of molecules into protobionts. So these are aggregates of abiotic least, uh, produced molecules surrounded by a membrane 
or membrane-like structure. Experiments demonstrate that protobionts could have formed spontaneously from abiotically produced organic compounds. So that's what I was talking about, um, the lipids and um, so on, forming the, the layer um, and forming kind of what looks like a, a bubble. For example, small membrane-bound droplets called liposomes can form when lipids or other organic molecules are added to water. So that's what I was talking about before. All right, so you have, this is what they look like. All right, so this is a real picture, and they actually can reproduce. It's a simple reproduction, what you see here. Um, and they found that um, they can do simple metabolism as well, like glucose phosphate, if that gets put into here, it actually, with other chemicals, um, can be form, make starch, and then amylase, um, if that enzyme is provided, can break down into maltose, which is a um, uh, disaccharide and um, can leave and be used and so therefore it can do they found that if you put certain things in the environment of these uh, protobionts that it can do very very simple metabolism all right and then the last one number four was the origin of self-replicating molecules so RNA came first so the first genetic material was probably RNA not DNA and RNA molecules called ribozymes have been found to catalyze many different reactions. So they actually, um, they're RNA, but they kind of act like enzymes in that they catalyze. So catalyze means to speed up different reactions, including self-splicing, so it can cut up um, themselves, so the RNA. Um, they can also make complementary copies of short structures of their own sequence or other short pieces of RNA. So they can actually um, uh, uh, copy themselves. The complementary um, means that um, the complementary bases. And so kind of like DNA replication. Early protobionts with self-replicating catalytic RNA would have been more effective at using resources and would have increased in number through natural selection because they have the ability to do certain things to help with their survival. All right, and so that is kind of how uh, uh, the kind of bacteria um, came about um, using those four steps in the condition on early Earth. So now we're going to look at, you remember going back to that tree of life picture that bacteria came first, um, and those are prokaryotic cells, um, how we know that. So the fossil record, we're going to look at the fossil record and how it chronicles life on Earth. So a fossil study opens a window into the evolution of life over billions of years. The geologic record, by studying rocks and fossils at different sites, geologists have established a record of Earth's history and, um, and so on. So what, we look, what we're looking at here is... <clears throat> Um, a chart that shows, let's look at here, here's eons. Um, eons, you can see here, are, so we have different eras, and the eons um, uh, make up the different eras here. And so it's kind of like down here to show that, that all of these here were part of that first eon, all right? And then this next eon is way down here, and then this EN is right here, and, and this one is right here. All right, so um, so then we have so we break it down into smaller sections. So eras, then we have periods and epochs, and then here's your ages. Um, and MYA means million a million years ago, million years ago. So 0 0.01 million years ago, all the way to. 4,600 million years ago. So time is going, this is the oldest down here, and this is the present. So old, present. All right, so that's how what we're looking at here. 
And so you can see then they give you important events here of what happened and they give you pictures to illustrate that. So let's just go through here. And I do want to point out that you don't have to memorize time. You don't have to memorize the eons, the eras, the periods, the epochs or anything like that. We just want to get a big picture about how things have, um, where they show up in the fossil record and the kind of the order of things and give it, get a general idea. So we have our origin of Earth, then we have the oldest known rocks, then it says oldest fossils of, and I'm going import, to underline important things, oldest fossils of prokaryotes. So the bacteria um, is, have been around the longest. And there was probably bacteria that didn't use oxygen, so they're anaerobic. Because um, notice here, the next one, up, atmospheric oxygen increases. So we get our atmospheric oxygen increase. And then up here... We have our oldest fossils of eukaryotes. So here we have our eukaryotes. And then the rest of this is kind of about the different types of eukaryotes and when we find um, what we find um, and when we found it. Algae and soft-bodied invertebrates. So invertebrates are, fo are older in the fossil record than vertebrates. So organisms without a backbone. Then notice it says here, this is important, the Cambrian explosion. Cambrian, because that is the period in which um, we find that. Uh, and explosion, because all of a sudden, rocks in this time period, um, there were a whole bunch of diversity of fossils. Uh, and so organisms were very diverse. So that's the, an explosion of life, I guess it would be, um, which is why they would call it that. So then we have the colonization of land. So we find land, plants, and land animals. Previous to that, there was a lot of in the, in the sea. So therefore, organisms in the sea first, and then organisms on land. So colonization of, colonization of land by plants. Early vascular plants. So vascular means that they have tissues that allow them to take water up their, from the roots to the very top of the trees and things like that. So that means that um, they were able to um, grow taller because they had tissues that allowed them to grow taller. Um, then we have our bony fishes. Bony fishes there. So remember, we had our invertebrates down here. Now we have our bony fishes. Now we have on the land seed plants, plants that actually make seed and reproduce um, seed. And then we had a big extinction, the Permian extinction, where a lot of organisms um, were not found in the fossil record anymore. So we have our extinction there. Then we have gymnosperms. These are cone-bearing plants. Dinosaurs, mammal-like reptiles. Um, still we have our gymnosperms and dinosaurs. And then we have angiosperms. These are flowering plants. All right, then we have our mammals, all right, coming into, and then more specifically, um, so angiosperms dominance, where most of the plants are angiosperms, flowering plants. You have your primates, like your monkeys and things like that. Um, then this is radiation of mammals. So that means that mammals became, there became a lot of mammals. Um, that's what radiation means. And then we have the genus Homo, that's our genus. And then we have the last um, ice age and humans appear. And now we um, are in the present time. So that kind of, what I want you to kind of know is kind of the chronological order of things um, in which things happen. Um, not necessarily the dates and how many years ago and so on, but kind of just the order of things. So a clock analogy can be used to place major events in the context of the geological record. So they make it into like a clock um, to help with that. So that's what the next picture shows. So here we have, so this is, let's say this is the start right here. All right, origin of solar system and earth. All right, so 4.6 um, million years ago. All right, and so notice here 
that they put major events and it's kind of hard to see this each one of these is um, like supposed to be a different color there's like a different layer these two kind of blend into one another so there should be kind of a line down the middle here you can vaguely see it in here like that so it's showing you where that prokaryotic cells came first so here's the first um, so here's the start of Earth, prokaryotic cells. Then we have, here's atmospheric oxygen joins in. Then our single-celled eukaryotes. Then our multicellular eukaryotes come in. Um, and then our animals. Then land plants. And then you can see here that you can barely, barely see that little sliver. That's the little sliver that humans have been around. All right, so we have been around just a tiny, tiny little nanosecond of time um, of on Earth. And so that's the clock analogy that also gives you some perspective. All right, so let's look at prokaryotes. So as prokaryotes evolved, they exploited and changed early Earth, young Earth. <clears throat> the oldest known fossils are called stromatolites. They're rock-like structures composed of many layers of bacteria and sediments, and they date um, back to 3.5 billion years ago. And so I'm going to show you a picture here. Um, this is what stromatolites look like. So that's them in the water. Um, when you take them and kind of get a cross section and slice them open, they look like this, so you can see layers um, in there. But those are some pictures. That's another picture uh, of the different layers within the stromatolites. And so that's what stromatolites are. And um, when you look at them underneath the microscope and look at those layers, people with trained eyes um, have found fossils of bacteria. So the first prokaryotes. So prokaryotes were Earth's sole inhabitants from 3.5 to about 2 billion years ago. So the, the 3.5 comes back from comes from that oldest known fossils of the stromatolites. Uh, and so the prokaryotes were are considered to be the earliest living organisms. Um, now those prokaryotes um, need energy, so let's talk about electron transport systems. They were essentially to, er, to early life. Why? Um, and um, the reason why is because of energy, all right, the need for energy. Electron transport systems, what do we know those from? Photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So some of their aspects actually may precede life itself. So remember we talked about those protobians and simple metabolism, that's what it's talking about there. So photosynthesis and the oxygen revolution. So atmospheric oxygen here. So prokaryotes were around for a long time before um, atmospheric oxygen. So they were anaerobic. And um, so now we have atmospheric oxygen. The earliest type of photosynthesis did not produce oxygen. Um, oxygenic photosynthesis probably evolved around 3.5 billion years ago in what are called cyanobacteria. These guys are blue, green, algae. And <clears throat> cyanobacteria began, um, are thought to be the first ones um, to do photosynthesis. Um, earliest types of photosynthesis did not produce oxygen. There are other types of synthesis. Um, there are chemo chemosynthesis, which um, organisms use chemicals um, to produce food for themselves. Uh, and there are organisms that still do that today near hydrothermal vents underneath the ocean that's too deep for light to get through, but yet you have an ecosystem down there. So they uh, would be the producers. Effects of oxygen accumulation in the atmosphere came about about 2.7 billion years ago. Oxygen accumulation posed a challenge for life because organisms weren't adapted for that and so provided good opportunity to gain energy from light. So the cyanobacteria were able to do that, allowed organisms to exploit new ecosystems because um, they could use light as their energy source instead of other like molecules or chemicals. So then if we look at next, so at prokaryotes, then atmospheric oxygen, then we have single-celled eukaryotes. 
So single-celled eukaryotes. Among the most fundamental questions in biology is how complex eukaryotic cells evolved from much simpler prokaryotic cells. So the oldest fossils of eukaryotic cells date back 2.1 billion years ago. So again, you don't have to memorize these numbers, just kind of know the order of which things occur. So this is a review. Remember endosymbiosis or the endosymbiosis theory, endosymbiotic theory. Um, so the theory of endosymbiosis produces or proposes that the mitochondria, and what's the other one? and the chloroplast, which is a type of plastid, were formerly small prokaryotes living within larger host cells. Then the prokaryotic ancestors of mitochondria and plastids, that's like the chloroplast, probably gained entry to the host cell as undigested prey or internal parasites, and in the process of becoming more interdependent, the host and endosymbionts would have become a single organism. So we have gone over this several times in this class. So how they took in the mitochondria and the chloroplasts, and so this is kind of the evolution or the um, change in how um, eukaryotic cells came about. They engulfed the photosynthetic prokaryotic um, mitochondria and chloroplasts and became part of the cell, which then um, is now a eukaryotic cell. And so remember the evidence for that, key evidence supporting an endosymbiotic origin of mitochondria and plastids, similarities in inner membrane, structures and functions. Um, so they have um, the membrane-bound organelles, and they both have their own circular DNA, uh, so they're both, uh, the chloroplast and the mitochondria have their own DNA, circular like bacteria, and they have their um, uh, inner membrane structures, and then also they both have ribosomes as well. All right. And so, so that's our bridge between prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. So now we get multicellular eukaryotic cells and then plant, uh, animals and plants. So let's look at that. Multicellularity evolved several times in eukaryotes. After <clears throat> the first eukaryotic cells evolved, a great range of unicellular Evolved, And then also we had unicellular and then multicellular. And unicellular became first. So the, earlier, the earliest uh, multicellular organisms, molecular clocks date the common ancestor of multicellular eukaryotes to 1.5 billion years ago. The oldest known fossil of eukaryotes are of a re relatively small algae that lived about 1.2 billion years ago. Larger organisms do not appear in the fossil record until several hundred million years later. So that's all we have here, multicellular eukaryotes, but then we have animals. So large multicellular um, organisms like animals didn't, wasn't for a long time after that. Larger organisms do not appear on the fossil record um, until several hundred million years later, and Chinese paleontologists recently described um, a 570 million year old fossils that are probably animal embryos. All right, so so we're still again. Remember, we said that the, everything is a work in progress. We continually find new evidence and add it to what we already know to get the best picture possible. So the colonial connection. The first multicellular organisms were colonies, actually are collections of replicating cells that work together. So there are colonies of cells, single cells, working together as kind of one larger organism. Some cells in the colonies beca became specialized for different functions. So they did different things um, in um, the colony. And these first, the first cellular speciali specializations had already appeared in the prokaryotic world where in prokaryotes would work together and different cells would form different functions and they would help each other. And the same thing here going on with the eukaryotes. Now I had mentioned before the Cambrian explosion. So, so that is most of the major phyla. Phyla is the plural 
um, for phylum. So this is like the um, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, that's the phylum. So most of those appear in the fossil record during this time, um, appear in the fossil record of the first 20 million years of the Cambrian period. So that's going back to that picture I talked about before. So you have an explosion, it's not an explosion like um, fire or a bomb. Um, what this is is an explosion of animals. And so then we get the colonization of land. So most of these organisms were in water. Colonization of land by plants, fungi, and animals um, about 500 million years ago. And so, um, so that just gives you in words what we had talked about here and kind of the order of things. So again, like I said, I just want to reiterate, not you don't have to memorize dates and times and all that kind of stuff, but the general timeline of how things occur in what order and so on. Um, so new information, as I've talked about, has, have, has revised, and as it arises, it revises our understanding of the tree of life, and it can change over time. So molecular data is a biggie. Molecular data has provided many insights into the deepest branches of the tree of life. So as we have been able to get the technology to uh, analyze um, DNA and RNA and all that thing, all those things um, have provided some additional um, insights. Early classification systems, we've talked about this, had only had two kingdoms, plants and animals. And everything was put into those two kingdoms. And then we discovered, whoa, well, wait a minute, like we have bacteria and, you know, that's only one cell that's way different than a plant or an animal. And so then um, we, as we learned new things, we as people, trying to make sense of the world, Robert Rittaker here proposed, instead of two kingdoms, he proposed five kingdoms. Um, and those were Monera, that was all prokaryotes. He proposed Protista, which were single-celled eukaryotes. And then the Plantae, which is plant, fungi, fungus, and animalia animal. And so then we had five kingdoms. So that was the prokaryotes, the monera, and everything else was a eukaryote. And then um, we have replaced that. Um, it's been replaced by the three domains. That's what we talked about here, archaea, bacteria, and eukarya. And each domain has then been split into kingdoms. And then we have and then phylums, family, okay, and so on and so forth. Okay, and so breaking it down all the way to species. And so I would imagine that we will continue to revise this. I learned in high school five kingdoms, and actually what they didn't talk about, what's not on here is actually there's something in between five in the domains. They went to six, six kingdoms where they broke Monera down into bacteria and archaea, and then had protista and plants, fungi, and animal. And then they went to the three domain systems. So since I was in high school, there's been been, uh, it was five kingdoms. Then when I first started teaching, it was still five kingdoms, and it changed to six kingdoms, and then about um, uh, then it changed to the three domains. So I would imagine it's going to change quite a bit in, in um, your lifetime as well as we learn new things about organisms and kind of revise our thinking because it's always a work in process. And that is Chapter 26 in a Nutshell. <laughs>